So we're still trying to figure out what Google Glass is for and uh, what kinds of companies are going to spring up. So I'm starting to see uh, a few new companies in the Google Glass world, one of which is, is, is on the show right now. It's called Remedy, and they're uh, doing information systems for doctors and nurses to work together. So we'll see uh, what they're up to right now. I'm Norris Who are you? I'm Noor Siddiqui and I'm the founder and CEO of Remedy. Uh, what we do is we allow nurses to see what, uh, what we do is we've built a clinical collaboration app on Google Glass that allows the provider with a patient to show what they're seeing to a remote expert. Very cool. And, and Google Glass for vertical, this is a vertical market, right? Because it's not something you're gonna do in the street with your mom, right? It's gonna be for a very specific thing. That makes sense for me for Google Glass. Um, I'm still struggling with it. Is this going to go mainstream? But that, I think that doesn't affect your business, does it? Correct. Yeah, I don't think that um, from what I've seen and what people using Google Glass has really going to be something popular. People are going to wear at bars. People are going to wear it, you know, out on the street. But uh, what we have seen is a, a really strong acceptance in a clinical setting. Nurses, uh, doctors, physicians are all very willing to adopt Glass because they see uh, the advantages that it provides and. Uh, another thing that we found from, from testing is that patients accept it. So patients perceive that they're getting a higher quality of care when a physician, when a nurse, when a surgeon is wearing Google Glass and they realize, they, um, you know, they consent. That the surgeon will say, um, is it okay if I use this device to take pictures and videos to show to a remote expert, to show to your doctor who's not here in the room with me right now? And patients are all, um, they're okay with that. They think that's a good use of the device. So uh, tell me how, uh, what your system does and, and how it works, how it lets uh, the medical industry deal with each other differently than that you could with just a smartphone. Sure. So I think that uh, versus a smartphone is a really good question. I'm glad that you asked that. Uh, what the application does is it allows the provider with the patient, so that could be a nurse or a physician's assistant or it could be your doctor, show what's going on with you to, to a provider that's, that's far away. So what happens is that there'll be a 60 minute encounter with a doctor and three minutes of that encounter will cause you to have to get other diagnostic tests, to have to go see another specialist um, for your problem not to get resolved right then and there. So what we want to do is we want to take those three minutes that result in this, you know, all these un unnecessary um, tests and time being wasted. We want to capture that time and we want to be able to show the specialist who needs to see that complex or that specific thing that's wrong we want to be able to show them what that is, that your problem can get resolved faster. And so do you sell this to the hospital or do you sell it to the doctor? Because uh, uh, this is not something you just go into a Verizon store and buy, right? <laughs> sure, sure. So right now we're just piloting at Harvard. So the head of surgery there really saw the value in this and we're using it in, in night coverage there. So uh, what that means is that at night, there's not doctors on staff. They're on call, they're at home, but they're not on staff. So what we're doing is we're allowing physician's assistants who are at the hospital to show the surgeon who's at home, who's far away, what's going on with patients there. But yeah, I think you know the long-term question is how are you going to sell this? So there's a lot of different ways that you could go about that. We could sell to departments, we could sell to the institution. Obviously, as a startup, it makes sense to pursue the simpler sales first, right? Box first sale was to Stanford Sleep Clinic, not to you know Stanford Institution as a whole. And now, obviously, Box is powering, you know, not just the sleep clinic, but the university and the hospital and things like that. So we want to go after um, departments first because we have strong clinician champions who who support the use of the technology. Can we uh, see what it looks like and uh, tell me what we're seeing on the screen here? Yeah, absolutely. So this is kind of what the surgeon would see. This is a sample uh, fake case. We didn't want to yep. broadcast anyone's real medical problems here. So what, what would happen is that uh, the provider with the patient, the nurse wearing Google Glass, would take a couple of photos and videos of um, what was going on with the patient. And that's going to be labeled under a case. And uh, one of the big challenges actually was trying to figure out what's worthwhile to capture. What does the surgeon actually want to see? Um, so we kind of we put those, these two people in a room together. We put the surgeons, we put the, the PAs in a room together and we said, hey, what do you want to see from these PAs? And they basically said they wanted to see three things. They wanted to see a gestalt of the patient, so a quick video that is just them talking, the pallor, um, the rate of speech, their breathing. They wanted to see a physical exam. So uh, I'll show you what a physical exam looks like, an abdominal exam, something like that. 
and um, they wanted to see any imaging. So this case didn't include any imaging, but a lot of the times the physician will want to see um, x-rays, um, things of that nature. Yeah. So and yeah. probably if they're uh, n uh, not there in the, in the middle of the night, they're probably wanting to see vital signs and stuff like that too. Do you, do you pass any data from the machines that are ho hooked up to the patient at all? Or, or do I have to do, uh, if I'm a nurse, do I have to aim the glass at the machines to get, get that? Yeah, so yeah, currently we're not transmitting vitals. Uh, for the uh, use cases that we're pursuing, it's not something that's critical. Uh, we are uh, planning to go into other use cases where having vitals, something that the surgeon is seeing right then and there would be much more valuable, but we're starting out very simple and yep. the way we are right now. Cool. Um, so yeah, this is just would just be the way they'd access a the video, and I can show you what a physical exam would look like. Um, I think this is the physical exam. So this kind of answers the question that you're asking about, you know, why not use a phone? So you can see her hands are in clear view of the camera the entire time. Yeah. She can't use her phone because she's, you know, delivering care. She's doing, okay. she's doing a case. And um, there's been other cases. Okay. Oh, sorry, I'll just pause this. Yep. There's, been, there's obviously a lot of other cases where the clinician's hand could be have, have vomit on it, could have blood on it. Uh, for example. Um, some gynecologists and people in, uh, who are delivering babies have said, you know, this would be really uh, valuable for complex deliveries. You clearly can't, you know, be using a phone to do that. Um, and I think yeah. that's more of the, the harder reason why you can't use your phone, but I think the softer reason, that's also pretty important for, you know, these centers of excellence like Mayo Clinic, Kaiser, Harvard, for example, is that it's not perceived well by patients. If you go into, um, if you go into, the, into a hospital, you don't want your provider to have a phone in between you. I think the thing that's really valuable about glass and about other wearables is that um, it does sort of maintain that human, human to human, eye contact um, yep. thing that people want. Yeah, because it's uh, I'm still talking to you. I'm not looking through the glass necessarily, um, as particularly if it's uh, positioned right, you know. And I just have to look at you to take a video, right? Sure. And I think the other thing is that we realize that. Um, we, we wanted to make the application on glass as thin as possible. So first of all, when glass pushes updates, that, that breaks our application. That, that made us want to make it, make it thinner and kind of less involved with the OS right now. But I think the other thing is that we realized from user testing that the simpler the application was on glass, the more it was used and uh, the less distracted the provider was. Yeah. So um, that's, I guess, another thing that we've learned through, um, through yeah. iterating on it. But that is your app, does it, do uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, let me ask that question again. Google Glass uh, has a bunch of cards sure. that you scroll through with your finger. Mm -hmm. Some of the cards are like uh, your airline tickets, your Twitter, uh, your uh, stocks, your weather, stuff like that. Is there a way for you to turn that off for a doctor and just uh, focus them on the uh, app at hand? Or Yeah, absolutely. So that's obviously has been really important for you know, using them in a clinical setting. You don't want to accidentally share it to Google+. Plus. So yeah, we've locked out all other functionality, so the only thing that runs is, is Remedy. And uh, I mean, the way that we secure the device is through QR codes. Yeah. So um, we just print one of these out for the physician's assistants, PA, whoever is using the device. They wear it with their badge, and then they just use it uh, to log in. Um, so that, that way, not just any random person, that random patient will just grab glass and start using it. Have, have you gotten to the point yet where you've figured out pricing yet and made this a, a company? or Because you, your company is still young and, that, and this product is not even really officially out yet, right? Yeah, so. absolutely. So um, yeah, we actually have gotten uh, pricing fairly figured out. We can't talk about it right now, but we do have um, customers who, who are willing to actually pay money for it, which is exciting because when we started piloting it, we were like, well, this is sink or swim, will this be valuable, will it not be valuable? So it's been great to A, see that the surgeons find it valuable, B, that the patients perceive it well, um, C, that the people who are wearing glass are willing to, to use the device and don't find it too cumbersome or too much of a workflow change. And then I guess, you know, of course, the, the, the money matter, that you know, people are willing to actually pay for the service. So. Yeah. Why, why focus on this vertical? What got you uh, into this vertical? Sure. So um, I spent about a year or so in uh, this great place, Silicon Valley, and got a lot of awesome consumer experiences like Uber and Instagram and things like that. And uh, I guess I expected that, that was the way the world worked in, in every domain. And when I went to go visit my sister, who was in medical school at the University of Pennsylvania at the time, and I scrubbed in on some surgeries, I was really shocked to see that Shocked and pretty much disappointed to see the state of technology in healthcare. So um, 
as a patient, I don't want to go into a hospital that's equipped kind of the way that they are now. And uh, my his sister and I started working on this because we wanted to develop better products for healthcare. Doctors are highly trained, they're extremely hardworking, they have the best intentions, but a lot of times they're dealing with the worst technology. Um, so yeah, I mean, Instagram, Facebook, Uber, they're all great experiences and they're not extremely technologically difficult to build. It's more of an implementation problem. So that's what we're trying to solve. Very cool. How are you funded or, are, or have you gotten funding for this company yet? Uh, right now we're just working off of uh, Peter Thiel's initial investment in um, for part of 20 under 20. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we've gotten some, some interest from angels and VCs and we're going to be pursuing that pretty soon. Tell me about Peter Thiel's program. I've had a couple of people from the, the program on, but tell me what's going on there. How did you get into that? Um, yeah, when I was uh, 17 and I was applying to college, I also applied to the fellowship, kind of, you know, thinking this would be the... Fallback. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the crazy exceptional case of, okay, what if this works out? What would I do then? Um, and yeah, so when I was 17, instead of going to school, I decided to do the fellowship because I wanted to start making things happen now, and I got exposed to extremely uh, to an incredible community, both the fellows, mentors, you know, Peter Thiel himself, and uh, shaped me a lot as a person. I wouldn't be working on this right now if it wasn't for the fellowship. Very cool. Where do you think uh, this is going, and and uh, what are you hoping Google does to Glass to make your business even even better in the future? I guess. Sure. Um, I mean, I think in terms of like modifications to Glass are pretty obvious, right? Like the Wi-Fi right now is like it's a super old version of Wi-Fi. I think it's like I forget exactly what it is, but it needs the, the newer version of Wi-Fi would would make upload speed much faster. Yeah. Um, battery life isn't so great. Um, those are probably the two biggest things that make it succeed in a in a healthcare setting. I think the other thing is that so we haven't had any problems with sanitizing the device right now. Um, but if you were if we were using it in more of a rugged setting like trauma or um, you know paramedics disaster response, if the device device was more heat resistant, that would be valuable. Um, but yeah, for the use cases that we're pursuing right now, the device is basically adequate. And in terms of where I see this going, is I think that wearables are going to play a huge place, a huge role in healthcare. I think that what we're pursuing right now is the most conservative possible use of wearables, um, using it to transmit what you're seeing to a remote expert. There's you know, a million cases in healthcare right now where there's too many handoffs, where there's redundancy in care. You're telling the same story to multiple people. You can clearly condense that down. And um, what I was really shocked by actually from you know, stepping foot in these hospitals and talking to all these people is that um, no one's really thinking about how it's going to change and how things are going to be different. So like when I asked nurses and PAs, people who are you know, every day in and day out in the trenches here, you know, what they thought of something like EHR, like electronic health records. You know, what did you think of um, you know, doing paper records before? They said, oh yeah, paper records were fine. And then once we actually implemented EHR, they were like, wow, this is much better. So similarly, I think that's kind of the way that wearables are going to enter healthcare. So people are going to be like, oh, well, you know, it's not really so bad that I have to go you know, talk to four different people or that I have to wait two hours or two days or two weeks to see a specialist. But I think once, it beca once you know, a few of these you know, pioneering institutions adopt it, once Harvard adopts it, once Mayo adopts it, once um, Cleveland Clinic adopts it, which are you know, our initial pilot sites, once they show patients that this is how your care should be, it's going to become a standard of care. And then it's going to become expected that you, know, you don't wait two weeks to see a specialist. You don't have to you know, run all these extra tests. You're going to have cheaper and higher quality health care. Very cool. Uh, where can we learn more about it? Uh, remedyonglass.com. Very cool. Thank you so much for coming in and showing it to me. Thank you.